Hello fabulous ladies, it is Camille here from PrioritizeLove.com and I'm so excited to have a very special guest in today's interview series, Successful Women in Love, How to Have the Cake and Eat It Too. Today I'm talking with the fabulous Daria who is a relationship coach, she's a psychologist, she's very passionate about what she does and I was going to um, pronounce your surname, Hi to Glue, Daria Hi to Glue from dariahitoglue.com and we'll be sharing her details um, after the interview of course. So first of all, welcome on the call Daria. Thank you Camille, it's a pleasure to be here, thank you for having me. I'm really excited about our, our interview because we, we both, you know, share the passion for love and relationships. So with what you, with what you do, what made you choose to be a relationship coach? That's a great question. Actually, um, my first career was an economist and uh, I worked in business, in marketing and HR for almost 12 years. But um, before that career, I wanted to become a psychologist and I was always fascinated in this intricate um, sort of background of what makes people tick and how do they feel happy and why they be, you know, feel happy in their relationships. And some don't and some do. Um, so I was um, at, you know, always looking at that perspective, but I never, until uh, when I became a psychologist, realized that it's possible. I actually can make a living out of it. It's my first uh, understanding coming from Russia and uh, living in Europe and the UK and Switzerland. I thought, well, this is you know economics and business and finances. This is how you make money. But my hobby was always psychologist. I was coaching. I became a coach for coaches inside a corporation. The people would come to me with their relationship issues. I had lots of relationship issues myself. And I think, you know, we teach what we need as well. It's Absolutely. the best way to learn. So true. <laughs> so I went through multiple um, breakups and uh, I had ups and downs. I had successful relationships and some of them were terrible, just disasters. And I tried to understand what, what it is that I attract so many different types of people and I couldn't find that Mr. Right, that Mr. Um, you know, perfect match, but I was still looking and it um, cost me two marriages and a lot of learning on the way. I think I self invested in more than 100,000 into my own self development to realize that there's also um, this inspiration that I can share with other people. And bit yeah. by bit, I started working towards the um, coaching rather than business. And um, when I left the big corporation and big job, I was head of recruitment for one of the big multinational, one of their offices in uh, Europe, and uh, married my soulmate. And we had two kids in Geneva and Switzerland with him, and life was beautiful. And I thought, well, uh, this probably is the time, at that time, that I do something that I love. Although, originally, I thought maybe if I would retire then, I could help people with their relationships. Because I did not believe in myself for a long time. And I thought I had to do certain things to work 9 to 5 or 9 to 9 mm. and, uh, and do what I did. But then, you know, having that support, loving relationship with my um, partner allowed me to spread my wings and take this step into this um, fearful kind of void uh, ocean of fear and start my own business and start something that I love. And my main fear was of failure. My main fear was of not making it happen. And when I left uh, the corporate job, I was already in you know, a six-figure, and I thought, how would I make this work in a coach? And the first three months of my work, I was so passionate to make it right that I had much more in revenues than I had in my previous corporate job just being a coach. Amazing. So for me, that was not just an important um, manifestation of, the dream come true, but also for my family and for my husband. And that made him hopeful and you know secure and feeling yes. confident that I can uh, actually make it. And it's beautiful, this transformation into a different career. And the relationship coaching is a natural kind of affinity. That's something that I uh, allow to do it in a systemic way. And you know, therapy, kind of coaching combined. And it's, you know, in, in, in what you've shared in, in that way, we've got a similar journey, I guess, your, 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 your journey of self-discovery, then also once you really got what you wanted, you then wanted to, have to share 
that knowledge and you wanted to help other women in having the same. So you really sort of, you had to walk your talk first, you know, you had to discover all those things first um, in order for them to, you know, as part of that journey, you found your passion as well, which is just such a beautiful thing. So, so in regards to where you're at right now, you are now married. You found your, you know, your your life partner, your soulmate. You've got two two beautiful children, and your your you've built a thriving business and keep on, you know, expanding. What are you most proud of with where you're at right now in life? Oh, it's such a beautiful reminder to just celebrate <laughs> what I'm most proud of. There's so many. I think um, the um, fruitful partnership, this beautiful thriving partnership I have with my uh, husband currently, who is a soulmate, I think that's the, the biggest source of energy and also that's why I'm doing what I'm doing because I believe it's possible. And it's not about finding these one person, it's actually becoming the person yourself and then um, going on this journey together and making certain choices, which you know I can talk about how. Mm. But until that moment, um, there was a lot of living in the past, you know, trying to satisfy my parents' needs. And I married my first husband also out of love of my for my parents because they wanted me to feel to be safe, to be secure, be financially stable, and have that you know partnership which um, I created. You know, I manifested everything in my life. And then I realized it's not from what I want. I, I was following my um, cultural predispositions. And then at that point, um, I made how, a decision. How old were you when you married your, the, first, um, the first husband? I think I was 26, okay. 26, 27. And we had known each other for over just four years, and I thought that was enough. But... We never lived together properly. We lived for some short period of time in Russia. And then I studied in England. Uh, he worked in Russia. And then I studied in Japan. He, he was an Australian. And then we started living in England together. And we realized we're two different people. Although, you know, when there was space in between us, we were doing all, you know, our own stuff. So it was quite exciting because we, we lived our own life. But mm. once we started living together, we realized it's, it's kind of not what we want. Well, at least I did, because long term, I could imagine if I live that life um, and you know, have kids, I there's something didn't work. And actually, it didn't work physically. We tried to have kids and we couldn't. Interesting. We, and you know, I it actually it wasn't meant to happen with, it, with him. It was not meant to happen. You know, my period stopped for half a year at all, like, out of nowhere, and I tried all sorts of natural and medical. Um, investigations and everything was fine with me, you know. And uh, it's just the the body was telling me, "Hey, no, it is not the right, right it person. Is not the right uh, person." And I thank God for allowing um, just the separation, even without complications, without kids involved. So, totally. um, yeah, that's uh, that, that's what I feel really grateful for. And my biggest achievement, I feel, is that decision that I listen to my own heart and I listen to my own intuition to make that very tough decision to separate and to, um, to, f to be with my current husband. Because at that time, my friends, my parents, um, they all thought that I was living my dream life and I wasn't. So it looked, perfect. It looked perfect to everyone it looked else. Per perfect on the, on the surface. And to be honest, I was not, I was quite a positive person generally, so I looked at the bright side of things, and that's what I would share, uh, even with my parents. So people experienced shock when I said that I am going to divorce, and it was a decision, I generally don't like conflict, and I don't like to displease people, especially my parents, and I have a very good relationship with them. And that was a time when actually my dad did not meet my current husband until we had a six-month-old month baby. Oh, wow. So they, they, they didn't come to our wedding. They, um, they didn't want uh, to communicate. And I still made a decision, and I was already not in a rebellion stage. I was mm -hmm. already, you know, past that. But for me, it was um, a spiritual and long-term investment 
into my own life happiness and I knew that my parents would come around eventually. And I knew that my friends would understand that if I did follow their advice, I would be living a miserable life with someone who I was not meant to be with. Although, you know, I had made the commitment and my mind was like, what are you doing? You have everything. You have all the stability and security and, um, you know, what you wanted and he's a healthy, good guy. So what's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> they thought, yeah. So they thought you were unreasonable. So what what happened after you you went through the divorce? Like, did you did you stay single for a while, and did you do a lot of sort of personal development, or what what sort of happened in between those two relationships? Actually, um, I wish I did, but because it happened a little bit on a uh, in parallel, we worked together with my current husband. And we were friends, and we became um, like soul friends, like soul mates, even before we decided to be together. And it was for a long time, because I, I actually we knew each other, we had known each other, even before I got married to my first husband, that it was just a connection. And it was nothing um, there. And actually, I remember I was scared of that relationship. I thought, wow, that's a dangerous person. <laughs> you know, like he's so attractive, he's so like passionate. Oh no, he probably is gonna be unfaithful to me. I had lots of fears associated. And I was like, no, 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 no. I'm getting married to this, you know, loyal Englishman and I'm gonna marry him. And we both had a little bit of sorrowful feeling, like sadness when and then afterwards of course we, we talked about it and he remembered that as well. Like, meeting of the souls and we were like meant to be but like, oh no no my mind was like no 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 <laughs> so we, it, it was a long journey before we again met afterwards and um so i got married he had a long-term relationship meanwhile and we started talking and then at some point he said look i'm going to work on your brand we worked in the same company and he was planning to work in switzerland on the same brand so hey let's go out and get to know each other better so we went to a pub uh, next to work and we just sat in front of each other and it was like a trance. It was literally like I, I felt I'm, this is the person I want to be all my life, but I can't because I'm married. <laughs> so then it was this interesting um, journey of uh, I still wanted to make my marriage work with my first husband. So I tried everything, you know, I... Um, I wrote a statement of purpose. I tried to meet him on his level and try to make it work, and it, it just didn't work. So, it, it, in, a, in a sense, like a, a wise woman, I had a backup plan. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't yeah, leave. I didn't leave into nowhere. I wanted to be sure that I have someone. And some people say, "Hey, you no, know, you, you could have just had an affair, or you could have uh, had that." Greek, I mean, my, my current husband is Greek. You could have had a hot Greek guy as a lover, and that's going to be all fine. And I said, no, you know, I, I don't want to compromise. And I know that I had all this financial stability, and the Greek guy had nothing financially. Ah, but I felt he's such a alpha male, and mm -hmm. I felt that like I know he, he's going to make it work. I had an in-depth like, feeling you that although him. I trusted him, and all the people were saying, oh, he's like Ferrari, high maintenance, it's going to be hard you know, for you long term. I'm like, whatever. And uh, I just went for it. And I am so grateful for it, listening to my own intuition. And that's what I also teach my clients. That's our true. body and our you know, somatic mind knows it has so much more wisdom than our conscious mind. So, yes, I, I actually, in a way, prepared the breakup. It was not something like, okay, well, this is it. I'm going to be just on my own and then find someone. I was searching naturally, and I think unconsciously I was searching for someone. And when I found that, I realized that, hey, I don't want to settle for a mediocre. I don't want to have an okay, ordinary life with someone just because we had committed. 
So what, like we had a bit of a chat before the interview, you know, before we started the interview and we, we were talking about that, you know, some shifts needed to happen for you to, to really be ready for the right kind of relationship or, you, you know, in the past you were, you mentioned um, you were attracted to someone who was, you know, you wanted someone really spiritual. I don't know if that, if you're referring, was that your first husband or another past relationship where you felt like you, you know, you attracted very spiritual men but then other things were, weren't there. So what do you feel needed to align in yourself? Like what needed to shift so you were ready for the, the real deal, you know, that, that beautiful deep connection that you now have with your husband? What needed to happen for you internally? Mm. Well, there were a lot of shifts. Actually, the main shift was um, going away from someone else's wishes and desires, like I thought they were mine, but they were not mine. They were my parents or my um, society, my so friends, my culture. Yeah. And to realize what's me, who's me, uh, you know, what do I want? Who am I long term? Who do I want to be? And not to settle for simple relationships mm-hmm. that are problemless, but those relationships that open opportunity for growth. And realizing what my values are. So I did a lot of self-development work. And um, that's what I believe is the way forward. You know, we are, we are progressing. That's how we live. We are developing ourselves. That's how we live. And when we stop, this is the stalemate. That's when we start noticing that people um, sort of uh, stagnate in their relationships. And they uh, go a little bit separate direction. So as soon as there is progress, there is growth, and um, if both partners are prepared to develop, to change, to explore. And uh, for me, the, the big transformation happened when I realized that my value, number one value, is growth. So I found a partner who's also number one value is growth, and we both grow. I mean, we go to different courses, and uh, we went to Tony Robbins' Day to Destiny in December, just, you know, organizing that, you know, with logistics of bringing my parents for like two weeks from Russia to UK and creating, you know, the gap in, at work and going there for two weeks. And this takes um, guts and also alignment between two people. And of course, it's important to know um, physically who you like and have passion physically, because I believe in natural romantics. So if there is a a woman needs to almost want a man so much to have that stability. And then a man will love the woman. Men will have um, more likelihood to have sex with a woman when a woman wants a man. Absolutely. And he feels that desire, doesn't he? He feels yes, her. Yes. Yes. And he, op- he kind of sees that opening. And when a woman wants a man, that's for me the natural um, kind of flow. That's how it all starts. If we start with our mind and we say, oh, sort of... Um, I should be okay with that man. And I work with a lot of couples who are so into their kind of mental level. Yes, we should be all fine. You know, we are kind of two healthy human beings and, you know, we want to have kids or we do have kids, but we don't have passion. So for me, this is the, the big question mark. You know, how, how do people start the relationship? And that needs to be a, a natural inclination to having that uh, passionate start. Absolutely. Because I totally agree. A lot of fire long term and, and we can do the mental work, we can release the emotional blocks and fears, but physically it needs to have a compatibility. Yeah, if, if that's not really strong, it's it's not likely going to go stronger. If anything, it will weak. It will get weaker over time if it's not strong at the beginning. What else do you feel like is really key to maintaining a, a passionate relationship? Apart, I guess you mentioned the, the the values, shared values, the the passion. What else do you think is really important? Well, there are many um, uh, important bits. So. In a long-term relationship, if you say you have already a partner and you want to sustain that, it's important to have a, a good balance of space and, and proximity. So when you live and work with a partner day in, day out together, it's very hard to sustain passion. As uh, yesterday, Meg John Barker, one of the psychologists uh, in sexuality, actually, <laughs> that's her book, Rewriting the Rules, 
um, she was talking about it's hard to say to have warm and hot relationship at the same time. So if you want, you know, security, stability, safety, comfort, and loving, caring partner, it's hard to have passion and kind of uh, uh, this enigma and adventure at the same time. Mm-hmm. Also, Esther Perel did the research in that, and, and that's what uh, she also supports in terms of having the distance between your so as you were saying about the it's hard to get the it's hard to have the passion and you mentioned the security versus the passion so what what's the answer with that one then so it's important to have um let's say a dynamic uh, a balance between having time when you're very close to each other and uh, seeing and having that connection and intimacy and um, time that is, let's say, quality time, mm-hmm. quality time mm-hmm. together, and also space in between. So for people who work together or live together, they need to have that time separate. And separate time when you allow yourself to see your partner in their, let's say, zone, in their best element, to feel inspired by what they're doing, to have that admiration to respect their element because it's important to have similarities but also to have differences. So on those differences, we learn and we grow. We meet on the level of similarities and we grow on the level of differences. Absolutely. Having that uh, balance and um, maybe a routine when there are, you know, for example, with my husband, we have our dates, date nights when we park our kids and we, despite all the projects and work and, and uh, we know we will, if we don't prioritize our time together to have a date, we will not have a date because being parents, being partners, being financial partners, being lovers, being, um, you know, um, uh, all sorts of roles, you mm. know, friends, we spend so much time in transactional uh, dialogues, you know, what needs to be done, what, what we're doing and always it in a way creates a warm relationship but not passionate so for a passionate relationship we need space it's a place we go we need to create that space and move away from each other for a short bit of time and then this is the pool the proximity because once uh, if there is a natural uh, attraction when two people separate and their emotional worlds kind of cool down and they forget or come into terms of some emotional maybe turbulences towards each other, then when they come together, that's where the proximity happens and that's where passion reignites. Beautiful. So this, we want to have more of those is this um, kind of a strategy of like, um, uh, you know, separate and meet again, separate and meet again. And I love, I love, I love that because I mean I often talk about when um, you know the initial stages of dating. My, I, I strongly believe, and and John Gray um, talks about it too. From men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Men, men often actually need to be away to in order to really they need, they actually fall in love when they're away from a woman more so. So sometimes. There is that. There does need to be that build up again because otherwise, it's just there's no dance, there's no tango. It's just sort of. So there is. It's so important, even at the beginning of a relationship, not to move too fast. And I think um, some a lot of women sometimes have have difficulties with um, accepting that sometimes you know men do also need a bit of space to to feel that, you know, that longing and that wanting to be closer again. It's so important, but it's, it's the same thing in the long-term relationship, absolutely. Wow, yeah, you said something very important. And actually, that what happened with us. Um, we couldn't be together for a long time. And uh, we had that friendship and we found out everything about each other, being away from each other. So talking on the phone, connecting through you know, FaceTime and having that kind of pool, but we, were, we couldn't, you know, the resistance. So that's a very important one, and we still remember that time. And um, I think if we got together very fast and close and had you know, sex very fast, it wouldn't be the same start. And I don't know whether we would have been together in the long term. 
definitely. So that was a big part of of, of a successful beginning. That that the the build up and uh, it taking it really slow. So with your with your business now, I mean the relationship. You say it's 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 all you know in such a great place. You've got um, a three year old and a six year old child as well, which is yeah. which is beautiful. So with with your business, what keeps you what keep what keeps you motivated to keep it growing? Because you are at a good place. You could just now sort of cruise along a little bit and and just enjoy life and but you are a woman on a mission so what's your driver with yeah, just keep that's exactly it so a mission my mission is to help uh, I have a big mission when I say it, I feel scared uh, my mission is to help 1 billion people to create love rich and blame free families and individuals one and I feel subtle, 1 billion that's massive that's massive <laughs> so and I don't know how long I will leave, but I want to reach out to people like you yourself and more people who are influencers and people who work with other people so we can um, create this world and change it to be a better place and eradicate emotional violence. And main violence is to ourselves, and we have that in our head most of the time, right? So we uh, either devalue ourselves and lower our self-esteem, and that's why we see so many atrocities in the world and like wars and violence physically or um, mental violence and you see certain decisions are made that are not um, beneficial for many people but I believe if we start raising self-love self-confidence self-esteem and learn uh, tools and strategies so we can create better families and educate better kids and raise those kids who would be uh, love rich rather than uh, blame Cool. so it's, that's my mission that's that's beautiful i mean massive massive mission and of course as you said like the the way we have relationships it will affect it's the ripple effects isn't it it's the way then our children grow up it's the way they connect and and the world really needs strong relationships right now it's crucial so the work the, the work you do is absolutely it's so so important because yes, and I believe it will be even more. Like the world we live in and creating a virtual world, we're creating a world full of demands and high pace with technology and everything needs to be happening immediately. What we see in psychology and also in uh, issues that people are having is the disconnect between the virtual world or relationships that are perceived in social media versus how they feel it or embodied experience. So for me, the role of, um, of the relationship coach, like you and me, we help people to feel better with whatever resources they have and create a lasting, loving uh, relationship that is more nurturing and beneficial for people because we know from the research that when people have enriched relationships, they feel more happy and more fulfilled. You know, the Harvard Grant study, 75 years of research into happiness, they realize that what, number one factor for happiness is the enriched relationships. Yeah? That's right. I mean, That's, people don't say when they're 85 years old, oh, I wish I would have made more money, or I wish I, they usually talk about the, the, the quality of their lives was really very much determined by the quality of their relationships. Absolutely. Exactly. And we, unfortunately, are not taught at school, not at universities, or even in our families how to build relationships. What we know is kind of a common sense. We're supposed to know how to create, how to meet a man, how to meet a woman, how to establish loving connection. And that's left as an afterthought to someone to figure out later when they have issues. So when, uh, as a psychologist, I meet a lot of people who are already uh, you know, at the edge of breakup in their relationship. And I always say preempt. You know, uh, prevention is much more best, it's much better than cure. So come to me before you have issues but you know the mind works um, a different way right it just feels like oh it's all good it's all good or even if it's not so good we're still kind of um, thinking feeling hopeful and it will work out but I always say this um, when you have a hole in the ground um, with time it doesn't become smaller it always becomes bigger natural hole and unless you put like concrete there and mend it and, and change oh, the structure of the road, 
it does not make sense. So people say, oh, you know, that person has a problem that I know when we start living together or when we, um, you know, stay longer together, it will, he will change. No, that problem does not solve itself. It doesn't go away. It doesn't go away. And uh, with the rain and thunderstorms and wind, it just the whole becomes bigger. So we need to look after our roads of life and make sure we have enough resources to fill those gaps and preempt and make sure that we, you know, we can cycle on that road comfortably if we want to. Absolutely. Now, I'm aware of the time, so we will have to wrap up, but um, I'd love you to share how the listeners best can get in touch with you. And I know we are going to share a link for an upcoming call that you are creating for Valentine's Day, which is which is super exciting. For Australia, I think, I believe it's going to be quite early in the morning, but it's it's definitely doable, so we'll share that. But in general, and maybe also tell the listeners in general, um, should people get in touch with you when they're already in relationships or, or, or also like getting ready for a next, you know, for a new relationship? Well, my expertise in, is in long-lasting relationships. So I work with couples and families who want to uh, bring more love and passion and feel better in uh, already established relationships. But sometimes when people uh, try different tools and strategies to find that ideal soulmate, there's also systemic um, background kind of, uh, um, that we could do the check and uh, to see what's preventing that. So part of my work is connected to the systemic dynamics, is to look at the family of origin and uh, sort out those clear the debris before they uh, go and start finding that um, Mr. Right. Like that. And, and once they find a Mr. Right, that's when, uh, when they want to create a long-lasting partnership that is so beneficial for both of them, that's um, the tools and strategies I have that I can share. And they can uh, get it on uh, my website, daria.com. I also have a Facebook group, Psychology of Human Enrichment. Yes, actually, that's. Um, can you say that again? Because that's a really thriving um, Facebook group. So it's called the Psychology of. Psychology of Human Enrichment. Yes. That is a, a psychology that uh, I, it's kind of I'm co-creating with other people, but I believe in this enrichment. The word enrichment for me is very close and. I'm organizing the Enrichment Summit, an Enriching Retreat. Enrich I have an Enriching Program, Enriching Book, Enriching Relationships, 10 Secrets to Rekindle Your Intimate Life. Uh, I have a new book coming called Enrich Your Life, A Guide to Fulfillment and Happiness. It's, it's kind of an all-around enrichment. And I believe that it's enrichment happens on different levels, physical enrichment, emotional, mental, spiritual, Beautiful. and just here to progress and enrich ourselves even more. And uh, I'm, sh I'm happy to share the tools and, and strategies for people to do that because I'm on a mission. You are absolutely on a mission absolutely in, a, in a big way. So with just quickly, also I noticed on your website, um, there are retreats. Um, is there one coming up this year? Yes, so there's one coming in uh, up in Greece, and uh, it's in April. Yes, and it's a wonderful again uh, systemic approach to relationships, and uh, we will look at in depth into every case, every person's because every person is unique, and we'll look at reconstruction of those beliefs, values, and how to create a, um, a family map, a relationship map to move forward, and it's in a way it's kind of a, a luxury. Um, laboratory it looks, for it looks beautiful. It looks beautiful. Is it for couples only, or can sit no, single? No, super single. Yeah, I would say my clients are generally 50, 50 50 couples, fifty singles who really have tried everything and they don't know how to position themselves in the single market. And then we're looking to the uh, deep, the uh, deep stuff. Then the I'm not a sort of dating, or even um, I'm not a strategist for, to find a man, but. I work on a systemic level to uh, to clear some of the blocks. I love that. Well, I think um, potentially some of my contacts might be interested in, in that too. I know it's fairly soon, but yeah, I just had a look through the photos. I'm like, ooh, this looks so nice. So is that going to be like a regular, potentially a regular um, retreat that you might do once a year or not sure yet? Yeah, so the idea is to create, and it's part of the program, 
uh, for enrichment is to have this opportunity to meet face to face because I love working at, you know, convenient uh, through Skype and having this interaction in your own space, but it's important to have the somatic experience and meet um, and, and have that connection with the group as well. So Perfect. it can be in different location and I'm open uh, to travel and I do have workshops around the world and we, we do one in uh, Perfect. Canada, Israel and Greece, in uh, Switzerland, in UK, in Russia, in China. So a lot of different plans, but um, it's just a matter of timing. So yes, we will do once a year. And uh, also, uh, sometimes we do in different locations where I don't advertise, it's just more private work and we create groups um, where we go. And generally, I combine with a family holiday. So we bring uh, kids, for example, to, to Paris. That's where we organize in Russia or we go to Greece. Again, Easter holidays, that's when we organize the retreats to make it easy. And also, uh, great people to, to learn practical tools in depth. And your husband is... is is all is is very supportive of you you know growing your empire is he oh he says he's waiting for me to become a billionaire so he can retire <laughs> love it so he would be, he's not threatened you know because I, I, I talk to so many women and they often tend to say oh men are just them they're intimidated by you know powerful successful men but they don't no, it's not necessarily true well, there is some truth in that because it's the way how we manage it. Absolutely. When a woman becomes successful, generally uh, she uses her testosterone hormone to succeed, to focus, to be determined, cl uh, cl clarify her priorities. And that's when the clashes happen. Because, for example, if there is a, um, a dispute between like who needs, uh, like we have this space that, uh, in our office and he sits next to me. So we always say, okay, who, who has a priority now <laughs> if, if we work from home or who has a priority to go and pick up kids from school and it, this type of thing, so the, of course trading. And that's when most um, issues happen. But if we manage roles and we'll say, okay, well, I look after kids, that's my role. And I, I don't demand him to be uh, doing that unless he stays at home and he becomes a home, uh, home stay dad, which is a different dynamic. But I don't, I don't um, say this is something that I would like. I actually would like him to do what he wants. Yes. Once in his own space yes. and see him successful, see him um, kind of leading the way and explore. And I, I did, I would love to work with him. And, uh, and I, uh, I already see, kind of put the seed to become business partners. But I, I think it's challenging for women to become successful and sustain relationships with their partner. But as soon as, for example, what works for me, uh, I'm clear on my role that I look after kids and I look after um, our chores or so I, I organize you know, help, uh, nannies, cleaners, it's my realm. I don't involve him. And I actually don't demand him to be spending time with kids. And I say, look, as soon as you have, like, you know, two, two nights if you put kids to bed, I'm happy. So everything else that's on top is a bonus. And that's where my, mm. my stress level and demand goes down. Because in the past, I used to demand 50-50. Well, I'm a working mom. Why don't you take care of kids? And that's when we had clashes, and that's why um, it didn't work. Nowadays, I just realized, hey, we're different. I'm a woman. I gave birth to kids, and they're probably closer to me, although they're boys, but they still need, they're still small, they need my attention. So I decided to uh, go and drive them to school and pick them up myself, and then I have a, a nanny who helps me mm -hmm. during the day, and then I can work in the afternoon uh, when she stops and... And then when my husband comes back, I cherish my time with him rather than uh, demanding him to do certain things for the family. That. And that's that. what really makes a lot of difference. I just lowered my demands. That's a really that's a really good message, I think, for for some women, you know, for women to hear because I guess we do have this thing of oh it should all be fifty fifty and but in a way that is also not working because then it again it sort of creates that more of a competition and there's more of a business transaction rather than actually choosing what you want to do and then accepting that there are some differences and yeah he would absolutely <laughs> appreciate that I'm sure yes and I noticed whenever I demand and he feels my demand and testosterone kind of woman bossy woman 
you know, that that's a killer for sex. <laughs> so I'd rather have my passion with him and I sacrifice some other things that, you know, that, that need to be done in the house or, you know, whatever. I just rather have that connection with him. And I realize that I, I just, I want to be thriving inside me like this, um, kind of flourishing energy spirit that would heal him after him coming back from work, like from the war zone. And I know I'm so, I'm sorry to say, but I, I'm so much more capable as a woman to manage more projects than him as a man because he needs that focus and he needs time when he doesn't do things at all. Like I need to allow him to browse and not to, you know, bother him with chores because that's when his testosterone level is building up and that's when he's ready then to to actually meet me in my own zone. And then, of course, I can, you know, uh, I did the video on how to get the Valentine's present or something that you really want. So I generally say, look, I have a need, honey. I, I, would you like to know what I need without judgment, without resentment? And she's like, yeah, yeah, I would like to know what you need. Well, um, you know, I would really feel appreciated and happy. And you, you would make me happy if you just gave me flowers or if you gave me this and if you did that. And as soon as he knows exact things, how to make me happy, like, like simple, concise strategy, he will do it. He does it. But I... He does it, but I don't overwhelm him and I don't pour things on him like, you need to do this and this and this and this. No, there's no expectation. I'm saying, look, you can do it, but you don't have to. But when I expect and demand, that's when we have to Yeah. And can I just say, like, you just, you know, you're, you're a busy woman. You you juggle a lot. You've got your You've got your business. You've got your children. You are just, you don't look stressed. You know, you have this glow about you you look happy you look relaxed so it's working it's working for you <laughs> it's working because I relax myself and when I get stressed then I, it's my um it's my kind of you know inner alarm goes like oh, oh, oh. actually two days ago it was a lot of uh, stress and um personally we had like two birthday parties and everything I had to arrange and we had lots of guests and on top I had I'm writing a book and finishing. It was like just tons of things. And I realized, and we had nearly an accident on the road because I had forgotten to change a tire of a car. And we had six people in a car with kids and the tire broke on the highway. Oh my goodness. Um, so my husband got really stressed. And of course I got super stressed and we, we, we were, ha- I was happy we were alive and that's um, wow. happened just two days. So straight after, st- straight after I got a cold, I felt miserable and I had three interviews in a row. So what I did, I decided to take it easy. I put away all other projects. I canceled a couple of programs that I was running and I said to myself, I want to look after myself. And if I feel better and I feel relaxed than everyone around me, my whole family will feel good. So that's what I did. And yesterday I was sick, but today I'm all fine. So that's kind of... You bounced back really quickly. Bounced back quickly because I look after myself consciously beautiful well daria we could of course we because we have such similar values and we have similar passion we could talk for hours and hours so thank you so much again for sharing your pearls of wisdom we will be sharing the your website link um underneath as well as the link to the call for uh, the upcoming call just to wrap up one more one more question to the listeners who might be thinking, oh my God, you know, is it really possible for me to have a thriving business as well as a passionate relationship? You know, can I really have the cake you needed to? What would be your last piece of advice to, to the women who might just doubt that that's actually possible for them? I think this is exactly why it's possible because a passionate business is where a woman gets energy from. Yeah, if she feels totally um, flourishing in what she does, it will fill that bucket of her container with energy. So then she can spill it over on her relationship. When she's in a job that she hates, and that's same for a man, but especially for a woman, because in our brain we generalize and we have all the connections with other areas of our life. We don't compartmentalize like men do. You know, this is a job. If it's shit, okay, but at least I have my sex or at least I have my car or, you know, have a dinner. For a woman in in our brain, 
everything is interconnected. So if we feel bad at work, our kids will feel it. You know, our partnership will, will feel it. And so I would say passionate, thriving business where um, we are showing up with our mission that is connected to our values and um, beliefs this is the best platform to have more passion. Absolutely. And then, of course, it's so much easier also to attract someone who is, is, is drawn to that true, that it's, it's our true authentic, you know, energy when we're in our passion that, that, that then shows. So it's a lot easier to attract an amazing partner as well. Yes, there's one caveat here. Um, I've uh, seen many women who get so excited about what they do because it's also the same hormone, dopamine. Mm -hmm. We fall in love with either people or projects. We mm -hmm. can fall in love with our work instead of fall in love, falling in love with our man. So we need to moderate that passion for, uh, for doing. Once we meet someone who wants also to be with, it can um, be a, a negotiation point of how much passion we still put in our business. And I balance. I say, look, I'm passionate 80%. <laughs> the rest 20, I'm passionate for my man or for my kids. And I don't deprioritize that part because for me, family is probably as important as my business. Beautiful. If I just concentrated on business, I wouldn't have a thriving relationship with my kids. I wouldn't have a thriving relationship with my husband. I really balance it. And it's an important consideration. That's so, so true too. So to, to still keep that space open. Yeah. Yeah, we need to become ready to shift gears when we have a, a man who's maybe demanding or we need to move with him or we need to, you know, do some projects for him because he still wants us to, you know, maybe look after his clothes. <laughs> you know, like I do all the little bits and I love it. But at the same time, on, in my space, I'm the, I'm the boss, you know, but with him, I'm not the boss. I love that you've you you you're a master at that balancing the masculine and the feminine. It's, it's really. I think this is the, this is the uh, the trick, and I think a lot of uh, time when we forget to switch hats, to switch roles, and we bring that masculine energy to our bedroom, that's when it doesn't work. Absolutely. So and that's when the relationship don't stick long term, and we don't find it because we kind of overwhelm that with like our. Um, masculinity in a way because we're so successful Absolutely. so for me success is is not priority it's not for me priority is relationship and then when I put that first then success will naturally follow it will follow love it beautiful well great great way to wrap it up thank you so much again so much thank wisdom you. and expertise is being shared and, and of course we will continue to um, you know, we will continue our connection, and the the interview link will be link will be will be shared underneath the video. So thanks Thank again. You. Beautiful interview, and um, we will of course chat soon. Great. Well, it was a pleasure. Thanks so much to, for having for for having us for for, for being there. <laughs> I can't I can't find my words. Have an amazing evening, and we'll chat soon. Thank you. Take care.